<laughs> yeah, welcome everybody. Uh, some of you uh, for the, you've been on the, several of these with us before, so you kind of know the format, but what we typically do is spend a few minutes with our guests and hear from them. And so we're really blessed and honored to have Roy and we'll introduce him in a second. Uh, at the end, um, we'll answer questions and you can begin placing those questions at any time during this in the Q&A part uh, on the bottom of your uh, your screen there. And so drop those questions in there. Some of them we may answer in real time, but most of them we'll try to hit at the end with Roy. Awesome. Well, again, thank you for joining this uh, webinar. And we're going to be talking with Roy about viruses that will kill disciple making movements. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background on Roy, and this is really hard to do because he's so multifaceted. I mean, he's involved in so many things, but he is the the director for North America with New Generations, also the pastor of Shoal Creek Community Church, and has written um, several books. And one of those is called Spent Matches, and another is The Hybrid Church, which is really describes what he's doing um, with his own church in Kansas City. But Roy has a tremendous heart to see movements happen in North America and has a lot of experience with just movement leaders um, in various countries throughout um, the world. And so, yeah, it's, it's good to have Roy on. Before, I, before um, Roy shares, I, I asked Josh, you know, what is one word that you can think of that would describe Roy Moran? You know, I, I, I couldn't decide between Saint and Shekinah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, I would say again, multifaceted. I mean, Roy is able to do 101 things at the same time, and he's got so much going on. Maybe, like I could say, you're you're like the the ultimate plate spinner, Roy. I could um, be. That's true. And you say that you you function best when you have a lot of things going on. I've heard people say that about you. But uh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so you live with me. Yeah. Well, Roy, again, good to, to have you on. And um, okay. if you if you ever visit Kansas City, um, make sure you, you stop by and say hello to Roy. Um, he'll treat you to some great barbecue. Yes, sir. Um, so but um, anyhow, yeah, you, Roy's going to be talking about just some of the, the killers um, to disciple making movements. And I feel like this is really applicable um, to us in North America. Um, we, we see these things happening overseas that kill movements, but, but in many ways, I feel like there are things that really hinder even movements from starting here in North America. And so I'm going to just mention these. I've heard Roy talk about these on a number of occasions. Um, he's written about them. And the first one is called exceptionalism. Um, these are big words. Roy, Roy is also a guy that has incredible vocabulary. Um, you'll find when you're with him that you got to take like a dictionary with you <laughs> to, 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 to uh, define some of the words that he comes up with, just, to, just to, to know if they're really words. But the first word is exceptionalism. And Roy, do you want to just talk about how this kills movements? Sure. Yeah, you know, one time, uh, you know, it's, it's something you don't want to be known for necessarily, but uh, walking out of a service and I was at a church where they practice that glorification of the worm process, you know, where you stand at the door and people shake your hand and lie to you, tell you, you know, great, great sermon, pastor. This lady <laughs> says to me, you know what? I love hearing you speak. And of course, you know, your ears go up and you perk up and you think, oh, wow, I can't wait. What's this going to bless my soul? She goes, I learn a new word every time I hear you. <laughs> so I thought, geez, I ain't God. Uh, gave me gifts to be a vocabulary builder. That wasn't exactly what I dreamed about in my life, but I think it's exceptionalism. Um, there, there's a tendency to, for us to uh, to really uh, want to uh, depend in the movement world and, and really in, in all of Christianity. It, it's a, a virus that comes you know, straight from the traditional modern Christianity. That is these exceptional people. I mean, it's the reason we have mega churches because we have these exceptional leaders or speakers. They can really garner a crowd and uh, create, you know, some great religious entertainment every Sunday and uh, people go home, feel blessed. And uh, that's, you know, that's the extent of their uh, walk with God is, is really about them. 
Um, that's one place it exists. You know, we it leaks into movement when when we start looking for exceptional people, uh, and the movements are built on uh, methodologies and really uh, mindsets that are focused on ordinary people doing extraordinary things. Uh, when we first started here at Shoal Creek, I got this email from a kindergarten teacher uh, who had gone through our initial training. And in it, she expressed to me, uh, now, you know, I, I don't want to paint kindergarten teachers, you know, in, in some type of corner or not, but, but uh, th this gal was extremely faithful, extremely loving. Um, I mean, she was made to be a kindergarten teacher in that sense. But if you lined up 10 people in a room and you said, you know, pick three leaders here to start your movement, she would not be one of the three you would pick. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that mindset, you know, pervades. And, and yet she just, you know, said to me, this is the first time in my life, I feel like I've been given a chance to play, uh, mm -hmm. that, that I have a place in the game now. And, and she did, she invited uh, six of her coworkers into a discovery group. Um, she quickly understood innately without really any coaching that three of those bel were believers, three were non-believers. She started two groups. She led mm -hmm. the the believing folks go off. She taught them how to do discovery and left them alone and let them die. And uh, <clears throat> then she, she worked with the non-believers and, uh, you know, she was able to see um, them come to faith and multiply. The husband of one of those uh, co-workers uh, got interested and, and joined the group. And so um, if I were acting in my mindset that I was trained and I grew up in, I would have never picked her to do anything. Um, she would have been a follower, uh, not an initiator. And, and as a result, you know, my mindset would have killed movement uh, because I just wouldn't have chosen her. So it, it's that kind of, you know, uh, thing that, that, uh, that exists uh, and, and it, you know, it's reinforced in, our, in our, our entire culture as we look around and see, you know, in terms of sports teams, you know, we don't, we don't pick the worst player, we pick the best player, you know, and, and all, all of those types of metaphors that exist in our world. We don't read books, you know, about really failing business leaders. You know, we read books about successful business leaders. We don't go to conferences and hear things about people's failure, we go to conferences and hear people's successes. And so we, we raise up these exceptional people. Um, and, and as a result, uh, it, it bleeds into the, the everyday decisions that we make in the movement world about investing time, energy, and effort you know, into ordinary people. And also uh, really focusing in on our methodologies to make sure that ordinary people uh, can, can be able to pull those methodologies off and they're replicatable uh, in, in just about any, it doesn't take any gifts or passions or abilities or skills or, or knowledge or anything. The, 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 our methodologies are repeatable, you know, uh, despite someone's, um, you know, what they possess. I, I think it's dangerous, for instance, <clears throat> Uh, right now, we, we, you know, the word microchurch is a big word, and, and we see, you know, in, in the microchurch movement, it's, it's connected to a lot of the APEST stuff, and I think there's a dangerous uh, uh, mentality in that, you know, of, of looking at that, you know, release the apes and all this kind of stuff, and it's like, it, it, it's really echoes of exceptionalism, in a sense, and the, the fact is, is that, uh, you know, the movements uh, around the world are not built by form, but they're built by function. They're built by ordinary people doing everyday tasks like leading discovery groups and, and seeing people come to faith and, and letting those discovery groups move into churches and, and letting those churches continue to multiply either through discovery groups or immediately into another church. Um, and it's, it's done, you know, not with a, a focus on releasing the apes, not with a focus on, you know, a fivefold gifting or, or anything like that. It's done because people are growing in their obedience to Jesus and they're responding to Jesus's teachings and they're, they're fulfilling out and they're not held back by what they possess or they don't possess in terms of a gifting or a skill or, you know, their ability to speak or even the vocabulary, or all that kind of stuff. Um, it's just, you know, making sure that the frictions that we create, you know, are that are cultural in nature, not biblical, are removed and extinguished. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's a virus. That's, that's what 
what gets in unseen. You know, no one no one saw uh, COVID when it uh, left uh, China and you know moved <clears throat> all around the world. We didn't see it, but all of a sudden it erupted and affected all of us in a global fashion. And I think you have to keep your mindset, you know, focused on you know what viruses are, am I allowing to leak mm -hmm. into this? Um, and it's, it's why. You know, disciple making is a team sport. It's why authenticity really needs to be a part of every team so that we're constantly questioning ourselves, you know, um, and, and asking of all the new ideas that we come up with. Is this replicatable? You know, will it repeat itself in ordinary people? Yeah, um, I just wanted to, somebody had asked, uh, what do you mean by releasing the apes? And of course, you were talking about APES, some people call yeah. that the fivefold ministry. Apostles, so, yeah. Apostles, prophets, evangelists. Yeah. So there, there, there's some that say that, you know, what's wrong with the church is that we've kept them caged and, and we need to release the apostles, prophets, and evangelists. Mm -hmm. And, and I, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but I think if, if uh, it, it can be stymieing in, in movement, if, if that's what we're, we're yeah, if it, if it leads to exceptionalism, like, like you, like you point yeah. out, absolutely. So that, that goes to the next question, right, David? Yeah, but I, I wanted to just mention one thing. I mean, you, I, do you feel like it's helpful to focus on maybe the early adopters? Um, sometimes we call them like the, 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 the releasing the radicals is another way maybe of describing that. Would you maybe speak into that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, I think it's really important. You know, when you think about uh, Everett Rogers' uh, diffusions of innovation research that came out of the agricultural world that has spread all over and, and been validated in so many different social settings, that first 16 percent um, of, of people, the innovators and early adopters are the ones that have uh, or hear the language of scarcity. Mm -hmm. So uh, if you go to um, Amazon and you look up spent matches and you read the reviews, you'll find a review there that says, uh, so, and I, I forget the number they gave, maybe a one or something. And it, and it says, uh, uh, the, the, the church of Jesus Christ is not failing because Jesus can't fail, you know? And uh, it, it's like someone who read the first chapter in spent matches, which is just all about uh, how we're not getting the job done with the methodologies that we've chosen. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't choose for us to meet on Sunday in buildings um, at 9.30 and 11 and, and that kind of stuff. That's not a biblical thing, you know. Uh, we, we've chosen that. It's grown out of our Western culture. And, and so when people hear that strategy is, is not working, they get offended. Well, that they belong in the, the late adopters and that 84% that only really uh, move when they see social proof. Mm -hmm. That is, they, they, it's, it's like they're all from Missouri on that side. You know, they, they're, they're the show me people, you know, Missouri, we're the show me state, you know, so it's like they got to see it to believe it. And they, the early adopters are people that can, can move on aspiration. You know, they can move on a, uh, a virtual idea of something and, and they, they want to change. They just have this desire to get involved. In. And I don't think that that's necessarily equivalent to an apostle or a prophet or evangelist or anything like that i you know this this young gal i mentioned is, is a um a kindergarten teacher was eager to move i mean she was eager to to be an impactful follower of jesus where she lived learned work or played and um and so she really wanted you know to do something um and she was a you know she was an early adopter in that sense but you know yeah. if i use my my American kind of mindset, I might not have picked her out as an early adopter. So that's why you had to plant seeds and question your filters really quickly, you know, as you do that. But it's really important that you do understand, you know, the tipping point issues and mm -hmm. don't try to argue the 84% of the people into some type of strategy or tactic um, that they're not going until you have proof. So mm -hmm. leave them alone. You know, don't don't get into fights with them. Leave them alone. Find the radicals. Find the people that have that holy discontent that that kind of secretly have always said to themselves, "Wow, this if this is what Jesus intended, we're missing something." You know, or is you know they've got that kind of thought, and you make that legal. You you create a space where you can make that kind of thinking legal, and you'll be surprised how many people think like that. Um, and as long as you're not against something, you're not trying to tear down something, you're just trying to start something new. 
something different. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that that's the real key, you know, in that process of finding that innovator and early adopter crowd. Yeah, awesome. All right. Um, and the second virus would be professionalism. And, and I've heard it said, I think you said it before, that a, a trained outsider is less effective than an untrained insider. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I think, uh, you know, your story, David, uh, with your friends uh, exhibits that, you know, is, is that you you saw some, you know, a couple come to faith and they, you know, went, went some spaces in, in places where you couldn't go. Uh, you know, and, and as a result of that, you know, we have to realize is that, um, you know, Jesus practiced that principle so often, you know, in, in terms of relating to people when he healed the, the gathering demoniac, you know, and, and you would think you would let him get in the boat, sit at the feet of Jesus and, and really learn, and, you know, learn the five fundamentals of the faith, learn the 10 basic principles of the Christian life, learn, you know, how to do a quiet time, learn, learn how to, you know, pray, learn how all that kind of stuff. And then Jesus would have released him to go back, you know, into the capitalist area and, and spread the gospel. But that didn't happen. Jesus just said, go back and tell him what had happened. He released him immediately. And uh, I, I think we have, um, we, we have, have embraced our, um, we've crossed the line into, in, in so let's, let's say the line is, is infinite and finite. Okay. So this line, God is infinite. He's limitless um, and, and with everything. And we're finite. We aren't. And yet somehow we think in our finiteness, we have the ability to, um, to be able to uh, identify and ordain orthodoxy. You know, we have subject matter experts that, that really are in control. And when you achieve a certain level of knowledge or whatever, based on some subject matter experts judgment, then you can go. And uh, the, the reality is, is that, um, that that's just not a sense of trust, you know, in, in the fact that this is a spiritual battle. It's not an academic battle. You know, th this is a spiritual battle. And we have for so long um, not been willing to lean into that in the fact that, that you know, we, we don't believe in, a, in a, a, a dual God. We believe in a triunity. You know, there is a spirit uh, that is at work in this world, even though it, the, this, this world is Satan's world. And so our, our inability to trust the spirit and the power of the word of God together in the lives of ordinary people uh, cause us to want to rise up in our finiteness and say, okay, you're, you're qualified. You know, you, you have reached certain level of, of knowledge or practice or whatever you're qualified. And that, that's just a, a stymieing thought, you know, uh, and, and that's not a new thought, you know, I mean, that thought was, was around, um, that was part of what started my journey reading the, uh, uh, uh uh, oh, I'm forgetting the book now. Uh, rapid expansion of the church. That's not the right word. Help me, Josh, here. Um, uh, Miraculous any, movement? I don't know. No, no, no. It's way older than that. 1900s. Uh, uh, a Methodist missionary. I'll think of his name in a minute. Someone out there will know. Someone can put it in the chat or something. Um, but um, the spontaneous expansion of the church and its hindrances. There's the name of the book. Um, and, and he was identifying that you know, back in the late 1800s, uh, early 1900s, saying that we don't have enough money to build enough at, uh, schools and hospitals. And that was the, the preferred uh, strategy of moving the gospel around the world at that time. We don't have enough money to do that. And, and then he also identified the fact that um, the way we train people, we, we pluck them out of their context, we bring them to Europe, we put them in, in European institutions and training, and then we want them to go back. And, and they're so unqualified by the time they get back to, to work in their own cultures, uh, mm. that we're killing ourselves, you know? And, and so uh, this, this idea of professionals, you know, Jesus developed people on the job um, in, in real time and in real time coaching and high relational connection. Yeah. Uh, and, and that that's the beauty you know, of, of what Jesus is doing um, and, and the beauty of transferring, uh, transferring you know, these, these uh, values 
uh, because they're seen, they're taught, they're caught, they're seen, they're heard type thing. Um, and, and so our, I mean, there's nothing, nothing inherently wrong with, you know, ordination or certification or qualification or all that kind of stuff, um, unless it reduces the movement of the gospel. Yeah. And, and when it reduces the, the, the rapidity of which the gospel can move, then it becomes a tool of Satan rather than a tool of the kingdom. Yeah, I, I've, I remember reading so much about that with the, the Methodist movement. I mean, you have a movement that was just ordinary people. And then when it began to have the laity and the, the professionals, the whole thing just began to, to die. Mm -hmm. um, because it, it had this idea that the, the professionals are the ones that are qualified to do ministry. Um, yeah, that's, that's helpful. Um, the next one is mechanicalism. Uh, I like these big words, Roy, that you came up with. Is that even a word? I, I, I think we should. Uh, it you know. is now. It's uh, George, George W. Bush can make up words, so so can Roy Moran. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, I wanted to mention to everybody before uh, Roy jumps into mechanicalism that um, you can start leaving uh, questions in the Q&A at any time, and we'll get to those here in just a few minutes, so feel free to, to do that. Roy, what's mechanicalism? Well, I, I do think um, we are so desperate to succeed. Um, you know, I, I think a, 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 a balanced view of what's happening in, in North America, you know, would, would help us see that um, we're, we're, we're failing, we're, we're far behind. And, you know, I, I heard on a news report yesterday, you know, this, there's some uh, folks who are uh, kind of coming out against Christianity saying that um, uh, the Taliban, uh, uh, equating the Taliban with Christianity and just saying that the Taliban is not doing anything that Christians haven't done and blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And so the news reporters were saying that, that 80 to 90 million Americans identify as evangelicals. Um, and, and, you know, I don't, you know, they may identify with whatever they identify with. That's fine. You know, I had a, a lawyer friend the other day, you know, tell me that his, his work, his law firm was requiring him to be vaccinated. And he was concerned about vaccination because of some of his own health issues. And he said, so I'm just going to identify as vaccinated. <laughs> so it's like, okay. Uh, there, there's one thing of what you identify with, but but when you when we look at some of the hardcore research, you know, uh, and you start collapsing some of these things down, and, you know, you, you see that that only about ten percent, maybe nine percent of Americans really do have the kind of relationship with a father that will get them from this world to the next. Um, and so, you know, all of the money. I mean, we have all the wealth in the world. Um, and as a result of that, you know, we've got more technology, we've got more money, uh, we've got, you know, more talented people than we've ever had, all that kind of stuff going into the, uh, the, the movement of the gospel in the West. And we're still falling behind uh, and, and slowly moving toward, you know, that unreached people group um, status uh, if we keep it up. Um, so um, I, I think that we're so desperate for success that we grab at anything. So we hear stories from Bush Bori. Um, we read books like Miraculous Movements. Um, and and we, we see these things in Sub-Saharan Africa. And so we turn to the appendix and we look at the mechanics of what we think got them there. And we adopt those things. And we believe that if we do what they did, that the same thing will happen here. And, and the reality is, is that um, when, when you talk to, uh, you, know, you know, David Watson or, or Shidanke or Isla or Aichi or Nusser, or, um, Harry Brown, any of those guys, you talk to people who are, are, are fundamentally, you know, just in the, in the midst of, of this miraculous stuff that's going on, uh, you discover that it's not mechanical by any means. Mm -hmm. It is highly spiritual. It begins with this, this heart uh, for the father's uh, family to gather his family. It, it begins with this um, real desire to put the father's heart in my eyes and to see the world as he sees it. 
Um, it is, it's about, you know, loving people. It, it's about helping people discover the favor of their father who, who desperately wants them to be in his family. Um, and it's a spiritual thing. It's not a mechanical thing. It's not just go out and start a bunch of discovery Bible studies um, uh, and, and, you know, get enough of them going and, you know, movement happens. Um, it, it's far from that, you know, in that sense. Um, and it's, um, it, it's really about, you know, uh, trusting and leaning into the Father, the Son, and the Spirit and, and, and beginning to, to really have a posture you know, of, of uh, obedience and a posture of submission uh, to do the Father's will in this world. Um, and and that, that just soaks everything, you know, about this. And so uh, if you just come up on and you read, you know, uh, I, wanna, I forget what it is in Miraculous I mean, Appendix 2 or something, and you see the discovery questions there and you think, I'm just going to do what they did. And, and, and what's going to happen is, is what happened there. And the reality is, is that you probably need to ask yourself, um, who, who are they as people? Um, you, you need to be before you do in that sense. And, and so you, you come with this, this posture of submission to God and this posture of submission to kingdom and realize that the father is about, you know, bringing heaven to earth. That, that is his uh, prime, one of the primary you know, requests in the prayer that he taught us to pray. Um, and, and so we need to be about, you know, the father's business in this world. And, and what is that, you know? And so that postures us toward, you know, the, the, the not yet brothers and sisters who, who the father is drawing into his family. Mm -hmm. And then the methodologies are, are, are secondary, you know, to it. There, there are ways of going about it. And it's why, you know, different uh, movement tactics work in different places in the world because of, of the, the posture that people have, you know, toward that particular, you know, target audience that they're attempting to plant the gospel in. So it's not just, you know, learn some things. And I, I've watched this happen in, in especially in American churches where people get intoxicated on things like DBS, you know, and this is like DBS, DBS, and they used to do a lot of, you know, they're doing, you know, just tons. And I, you know, we had stories that flare up like, oh, here's the breakthrough, you know, this church, you know, in this particular place is having a breakthrough because they've got a thousand DBSs and that kind of stuff. And it's like, really? Um, and you dig into it, you know, and, and it's not really necessarily true. They had maybe a thousand repetitions of people doing, you know, discovery with different, you know, friends and neighbors and workmates and that kind of stuff, but mostly not in the non-believing world and that kind of stuff. So it's, it's just not mechanical. And that's why you'll find most um, movement catalysts will talk about, you know, movement starts with prayer. Uh, they, they want to re they want to emphasize, you know, that because we as Westerners are so mechanical, we're looking for the methods to make this happen. And, and first we got to figure out how do we be the people that make this happen? You know, how, how, how do we ourselves first, you know, come into a, a really significant union with the father. And, and so that our movements into this world are really, you know, according to him you know, not just trying to you know, do some kind of methodology and stuff. Yeah. yeah. What, what are ways that you would say can help us get to that place, Roy? Where we, we truly have the Father's heart for the lost. Um, we're truly relying on the, the power of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, I think rethinking the gospel could be really helpful here. Um, you know, it's... Uh, um, I'm going to get heretical here, but uh, you know, re rethinking, you know, we have, uh, at least I, I'll speak for myself, I, I, I came to faith in a kind of a four spiritual laws world, um, where the gospel was four basic concepts, the idea of, you know, God loves me, I'm a sinner, Jesus died for me, I need to pray a prayer and accept him. And, and so the, the, the impact of, of the gospel was about forgiveness. Is, is that's what it was all about. Get forgiven. And, and then there was this two-step process. Once you get forgiven, at some point, um, you kind of come to a point where someone starts challenging, you need to stop just being forgiven and start helping other people get forgiven. And unfortunately, that second step never really 
catches hold in the majority of, of Christians in the West. Uh, we get to just where we're forgiven. And, and that's unfortunately because of the way we were exposed to the gospel, God was a judge. And, and, and I, I need to get right with the judge. And if I get right with the judge and just keep my life within the lanes for the, you know, foreseeable future, then I'm good. And, and the reality is that that's so, so perverted in the sense. I mean, it, it's a part of the truth. It's not the whole truth. Mm -hmm. um, the, the whole truth is, is, is that we have a father in heaven who wants a family. And, and at the core of who he is, he, he has uh, a heart of generosity. He, the father, the son, the spirit wanted to give away the relationship they had. And so as a result of that, um, you know, they, they created angels first and, and, and that, that didn't work really. And they created humans and that didn't work, but it didn't cause, you know, a father, son, and spirit to give up. Um, they still pursued us and actually putting their relationship at risk to give us the opportunity to experience what it's like to live like they live by the sun coming and dying in our place. And we see that fracture that happens, you know, in, in the relationship there in that, that moment that is so theologically threatening to us um, to, to come to grips with the, the profound love that, that, that they have and, and what the links that they will do to go to get us into their family. And, and as we begin to understand that, and then we begin to understand our own depravity and, and, and how you know, we just didn't violate God's laws. We broke his heart. You know, we were his cherished children made to, to, to live in his image. And, 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 and we just, you know, flipped God off regularly in our lives when he loved us so dearly and sacrificed the most precious relationship that existed so that we could have a place in his family. I think when we, we re-engage the gospel, you know, in, in terms of a Genesis to Revelation deal, we begin to understand what God is up to. And, and that begins to help me lean into the heart of my father and, and the reality of knowing that my father, um, so desperately wants me to be a part of his family. And therefore he wants me and my neighbor and my cross the street neighbor and the people I work with and, and the refugees coming from Afghanistan and the Taliban and Al Qaeda, you know, uh, 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 ISIS K, you know, all, all he, he, he has so desirous of bringing these people into his family so they can learn to live in the, his favorites, the best life that they could ever live that was designed for them. So I, I think, you know, <clears throat> into that story is, is really, really important. I mean, obviously going back to the scripture and, and reading and letting the Holy Spirit work in our hearts, the, the things that you're talking about are important. Are there other resources that you would recommend? Uh, maybe books that help capture this idea. Yeah, I think uh, Floyd McClung's, you know, book on the father's heart um, is really good. I think, um, uh, the uh, Return of the Prodigal uh, by Henri Nouwen uh, and, and really sinking down into Luke 15 and especially in verses 21 through 24 when you, you see the father who sees the son from afar off and you just sit in that idea that here is a, a son who had so abused his father, publicly shamed him, and yet this father is every day on the edge of this the city looking and waiting for this idiot son of his to come home, you know, and you begin to realize that Jesus is telling a story about his father. Yeah. He's telling a story about the father, our father, you know, and that kind of stuff. And so sitting in that and just realizing, you know, how much the father um, has given and, and wants us and how much we've offended him and how much he's forgiven us for. And, 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 and he so desperately, you know, wants us in his family. Hey, those, those two things, um, Abba's Child by Brendan Manning, is, is, it was really helpful to me. And Brendan Manning's prodigal, um, uh, the prodigal gospel, what's Brendan Manning's book? Uh, um, Ragamuffin Gospel. Ragamuffin Gospel, thank you very much. Yeah, senior moment there. So, uh, Awesome. Well, let's talk about the, the next one. It's uh, partialism. Well, I think, you know, it's... Um, this 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 gets me in a lot of trouble, uh, and I, I'm uh, I hope that you can hear me. I'm a friend of all, 
um, any any strategy, anything that brings people into the family, you know, I'm, I'm for, I'm, I'm not against anything. But I, I do find that um, Americans uh, sort of operate on that uh, uh, kind of Ford principle, you know, we have a better idea, you know, as you see Ford's, the Ford auto companies um, motto and um, it, there are, there are uh, at the strategy level, people who think multiplicatively in movements. Um, and, and, and then they have built tactics, methodologies to get there. And many of those, those methodologies were built out of a specific cultural context. Um, so Ying Kai, Steve Smith, uh, Curtis Sargent, and, and you know th those guys have focused in on and, and has some great you know stuff you know for that. David Watson in a different part of the world in a different space. Um, they all get to movement. They all get to this point where you, you've got a hundred churches, not groups. Now, hundred churches have multiplied to the fourth generation. Um, you know, representing maybe a thousand groups. Some people add four streams in there. Um, they all get you know to that point. Um, but, but they have focused in on their target audience. And mm -hmm. oftentimes I find that Americans especially are very interested in um, kind of picking and choosing. It's like they come to the movement world and they see the movement tactics as a buffet. And I'm going to go to the buffet and I'm going to get the things I like and I'm going to leave the things there that I don't like. Uh, and, and the reality is I've watched people get be in trainings with people like David Watson and then go out of there and add change and, and alter the things. And I'm thinking, wait, 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 you're talking to a, a guy God has used to do some amazing things. And why do you think you're smarter than he is? You know, understand your audience, understand what tactics might relate to your audience and then lean into that and learn from the people who've been successful at it and stop trying to alter it. You know, mm -hmm. to, you know, you, when you get good at it, when you start replicating and you get enough experience to, to see groups, you know, respond groups, respond groups and move into churches it, at that point, then I might listen to you in terms of some of the things you're getting, but too many people take from here and there and here and, and they fuse these things together. And so they say, well, why don't move? Why don't we have movements in North America? It's, it's because you didn't listen to the people who have movements in the first place. Yeah. You know, listen, listen, you know, I, I, I wish Steve Smith was still with us. A brilliant guy. Uh, what a brother. Um, he and I are both Baylor grads. And so Sikkim Bears, you know, national champions this past year. I had to mention that. Sorry. Um, but a uh, you know, brilliant guy, you know, and Ying now lives in, in in Austin and, and uh, Curtis is here with Zume and, and, and that kind of stuff. And, and, you know, new generations, you know, kind of moving out of the David Watson stream with the, the habits training and stuff like that. You got to understand your audience and, and pick the tactics that work in your audience. Don't pick the tactics that you like or, or, or that are comfortable to you or that kind of stuff. Your audience determines your tactics, yeah. not you. And so fusion, people just start picking and choosing off the buffet table and, and, and mix and match what they want. And, you know, it, it's kind of like a suicide drink at Quick Trip or something. You know, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, you know, so. Um, you know, with that in mind, can you speak a little bit to the um, irreducible minimum idea? Um, I know that when we develop the, the habits of a multiplying disciple, we basically talk to movement leaders all over the world and came up with uh, irreducible minimum. And I wondered if you could just speak to that a little bit. Sure. You know, the, uh, that irreducible minimum, you know, comes out of, um, uh, I got it from a, a book called Darwin's Black Box, uh, where uh, Michael Behe, a, a biochemist uh, from Lehigh University, uses it to talk about, you know, the, the evolutionary process and how it, at some point, like with sight, you, you have to have a certain irreducible minimum of things before sight will work. And so his point is, as he's arguing against evolution, is that all these things have to evolve at the same time and they have to hit at the right point. They have to all be mutations at the right point to be together. And then voila, you, you've got sight. Um, well, I think the same thing happens, you know, we've discovered, David, as our team looked around the world and, and, and realized that there are some irreducible minimums. Um, and, and we kind of focus those down, you know, on the heart of God. Uh, the, the idea of, of having a submissive um, 
attitude toward our father in such a way that, that we lean into a relationship with him that it drenches us and our world in prayer. Uh, we learn to engage you know, with the non-believing world. We find persons of peace in that non-believing world. We invite them into uh, a discovery. So they learn to discover what God is saying about life and obey it and share it. Uh, and then it, it, as they begin to embrace the teachings of Jesus and the cross, and they form into uh, assemblies or churches. And, and those churches then become a platform for multiplication that, that takes place. And so it's a lot like a, a mousetrap. You know, I, I was just cleaning out my, uh, my pantry yesterday looking for some some poison to uh, feed to the moles that are tearing up my yard right now. And um, I, I found my bag of mouse traps. I, I don't have mice anymore, or at least not at this point in time of the year, but uh, you know, a mouse trap has certain irreducible minimum pieces. You know, there's that platform, there's the spring, there's the wire that goes around, there's the, the trigger and the tongue, there's the hook that hooks to the trigger and that kind of stuff. And so if all of those aren't there, the mousetrap doesn't work. It just pieces parts and it's just useless. But when they're all there together, then, then it works very effectively um, if you know how to bait it. And uh, it, it you know, captures those mice and sends them on to a better world. Um, so I, I think in, in, in the movement world, we've discovered you know, from, from our friends and our mentors uh, in, in the new generations world, we've discovered that there are certain irreducible minimums. They all must be there if they're not there. Um, you can't just go out and start a bunch of discovery groups and think that, okay, I got a bunch of discovery groups. And many, many churches have turned their entire group system into discovery groups, thinking they're going to start movement. And uh, uh, it, it's just, that's just not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. We're, we're going to get to some questions here because we've had a few really good ones come in. First, I just want to say that uh, I was at Roy's house last week and your house sounds like a really rough place to be a critter based on what you've said about mice and pigeons and such so um so yeah i want to combine two really good questions because they're asking a different version of the same thing so i'm going to ask them both together and you answer as you see fit the first one says i find that as a pastor there is a quote unquote tug of war between seeking to live as Jesus did and still operating in the context of what church is like now, what practices have you adopted to stay on track in the midst of pioneering something new? And then let me go ahead and ask this other question. Um, they said, uh, Roy has a helpful book out about a uh, hybrid church. Any advice for those leading an established church, but feel called to rethink how we do church? beyond working with the fringe people, does Roy have advice on the balancing of the gatherings, traditional format versus DNM? So yeah, maybe just some, talk about some um, ways that you've experimented at Shoal Creek, maybe give some advice on what to do, not to do, all that kind of stuff. And you've touched on some of that already, but maybe go into some real practical detail if, if you're willing. Sure. Um, I, you know, from a personal level, uh, I, I uh, just have, have rip titles out. I don't allow people to refer to me as pastor. I believe that that uh, Jesus kind of spoke to that in, in Matthew's gospel about, uh, you know, don't call yourself, you know, don't, don't call me one father, you know, that kind of stuff. I talk about that spent matches. So uh, we, we try to create a level playing field uh, in, in the way we refer to people, the way we act. Um, I, I have always, um, from very early on taking people with me. Uh, one of our staff members, um, who's now a staff member, wasn't then, was just a computer programmer. Um, he was uh, facilitating a small group and uh, some members of his small group. Uh, well, no, no, they weren't even in a small group at that point. So some, some people called, um, frantic call, police are here, can you come? And, uh, you know, this domestic disturbance issue and, and stuff. And so I called him and I said, Hey man, what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm just sitting here watching TV. I said, I'll pick you up in five minutes. And so I drove by his house, picked him up and drug him into uh, probably one of the worst nightmares he'd ever been into a couple that were just having his knockdown drag out screaming and yelling and that kind of stuff. And, and, um, and so, you know, he got a chance to be there with me in the midst of this. And, and that, that kind of attitude is always pervade, always pushing people into things that, um, I mean, personally, I didn't feel qualified to go into that situation. You know, I didn't, you know, he asked me on the way back, he said, how did you know what to do? 
And I said, I had no idea what I was doing. I was making it up as I went. I said, that's what you call trusting the spirit. You know, you, you believe that the spirit of God is in this moment and, and you just lean into the spirit in, in that. And so I've always drug people into those moments and push them you know, beyond what they feel like they're qualified for, had uh, an in, incredible confidence that, that the spirit of God and the power of the word and a faithful person could be could be there i mean personally i've also tried to involve myself in in a lot of uh, like social stuff in in the city um you know involved in a rotary club for instance i don't particularly like going it's friday morning at breakfast um and it's it's oftentimes useless from a content standpoint but the relational thing is huge um uh, had an opportunity to take one of my Rotarian friends with me to South Africa. He had an interest in Africa, I had an incredible conversation one night sitting around um, in a, a beautiful um, space in South Africa in, in uh, Jeffreys Bay or in, in, in uh, Port St. John, smoking a cigar and just really scraping the Milky Way of God and Jesus and, and that kind of stuff. And I, I had a chance to see Steve, you know, embrace the cross and, and, and come to faith as a result of that. So I, I have to get in the way of non-believers uh, because I, as a natural part of my own life, um, being a pastor of a church or being a, ooh, I said that word, didn't I? Uh, be, being being a, a spiritual leader in a church, you know, uh, I, I don't run across that many non-believers often. You know, um, so I, I have to put my myself, you know, in their place. Um, I've restricted my language even though david says i you know, use big words and stuff i i i restrict my language I, I don't think people need to have to um define my jargon in a sense and so when i say gospels they have no idea what i'm talking about so i say the first four books in the second half of the bible uh, and so i have ruthlessly uh, restricted my language to try to make it normal for people uh, so that they could understand what I'm talking about and, and, and what I'm getting to. Um, you know, we, we focus on, you know, loving where you live here at Shoal Creek and help people understand that there are four basic arenas where we think God might use you, where you live, <clears throat> work, or play. Um, and, and so your circle of accountability, where is it that you are going to be responsible for lostness? Draw a circle on a map or around a particular group of people and say, I'm going to be responsible for lostness in that area. And that starts me praying. That starts me engaging. That starts me able to find persons of peace. And so the whole process starts when you actually put a pin in the map or around a particular you know, group of people or, or uh, you know, subset of, of people that, that exist in your area. Um, so I don't know. No, that's all super helpful, and it it flows right into. We'll, let's do two rapid fire, and then we need to um, we need to give some people on this call some instructions about some potential next steps. So here's last two questions. I'll ask them together, and you answer them in whatever order you'd like. They're they're short. One of them is how has your definition of church changed over the years? Um, and then I'll remind you of the second one if, if you forget, but the other one is when people, I love this question, by the way, when people ask what do you, uh, what you do for a living and where you work, how do you respond? Yeah. So definition of church and how do you respond to that question? So my, my definition of church really hasn't changed that much as it was part of what allowed me to lean into the whole movement world so quickly. Um, I, I was early on um, involved with a guy named Gene Getz who wrote a book called Sharpening the Focus of the Church. Uh, Gene is one of the most biblical textual people I'd ever met in my life. And so he just got his fingerprints on the Bible and just sort of churned that truth up. And so early on, I had this idea that, that, the, that when you see something, to call it a ecclesia, it had to have a vital relationship with God through his word, a vital relationship with, with fellow followers of Jesus and a vital relationship with the world on mission with God. So those three things were there. Uh, and, and so that just etched in my mind, that idea. So if you pull out, for instance, uh, Brian Sanders book, Microchurch, uh, you, you see the same three things. You know, you see Brian talking about worship, fellowship, and mission. You know, and so uh, th those kinds of things, you know, uh, uh, were really uh, on my mind for a long time. And so when I ran into 
um, you know, David Watson, David Rudrick, uh, the new generations crowd, the Denver city team, uh, it, it just sort of everything, it, it, it was clicking and, and really, you know, going on with me. Um, so, um, what, when people ask me when I say I play a lot of golf and I, I oftentimes play by myself. So I pick up people and, you know, invariably in the third or fourth hole say, what do you do? Where do you work? And that kind of stuff. So I say, I'm a spiritual literacy catalyst. Oh yeah. Yeah. Wow. Unpack that for us. Yeah. So, and, and, and uh, you know, and usually I get some kind of, um, you know, un, not repeatable here phrase that comes you know, what is that, you know? Um, and, and so I said, well, uh, basically, um, I help people learn to read the Bible for themselves and discover what God has to say about life. And now there are some people that look at me and go, oh, you're a pastor, aren't you? <laughs> you know, I say, well, I, I don't like to call myself that, but I, I do work uh, for, I, I work with a group of people uh, a fellowship of people who really want to make sure that everyone has a Jesus option in their life. Um, and our, our whole, you know, goal is to make Jesus accessible to everyone. Uh, so, uh, so that, that's kind of my, you know, my shtick in, in that sense. And it, it creates lots of interesting conversation for people. You know, they, they just like, that's that's unusual and stuff and so um you know usually the round of golf is over and we, we it doesn't go for it but when we can pick it back up you know things happen you know so so the spiritual literacy catalyst yeah, yeah, for you, you yeah. Ever get, yeah for me, oh, man. on the bottom that's my title so yeah i might be stealing that one man awesome oh, um Good stuff, David. Uh, I think we need to get into this form and, and give some yeah. folks some instructions. Sorry we couldn't get to all the questions. Um, does that sound good, David? Yeah, sounds great. All right, let's let's. So so guys, uh, this is really important. And we're going to get Roy, I think, here in a minute to pray over us if he's willing. Or, sure. Um, but we really want you to have some options for next steps, and so both in the chat box here in just a second, and then also with a follow-up email that each of you will be getting, there is a form to fill out, and we would just love for you to do so. Um, and it'll be pretty obvious uh, filling it out what you need to, to do, but there are five ways that you can get involved at the end of that form, and uh, you, can, you can check off any boxes that apply. So one of them would be um, helping to reach unreached people groups. Uh, so we have quite a few folks that are involved in doing that. And if you, you or your church is interested, we'd love to get you more information about what that could look like. Uh, David, you want to talk real quick about the upcoming DMM training? Because that's the second way people can yeah. get involved. Um, we've had hundreds of people go through the habits of a multiplying discipleship training. And so one that Roy was referring to, and we have a, a course coming up on September 13th at nine o'clock central time. And so we'll be sending out uh, the way that you can register for that. You do need to register ahead of time. That's in the uh, chat box. That's that. in the chat box right now also. Okay. By the way. Yep. Awesome. All, yeah. all right. All right. Good deal. And that's uh, again, September 13th. That's in the chat box. Uh, the third way, guys, um, if you have been through this uh, habits training that David is referring to, then we would love for you to go to kind of a phase two of that, which is a coaching cohort, a DMM coaching cohort. Lots of you have also gone through that. Lots of you still have not. We feel like that's such an essential next step. So um, we offer coaching. David, you want to talk about the fourth thing, which is yeah, uh, yeah. resources? You know, as Roy mentioned, you know, we really need to see a, a movement of prayer happening in our cities and neighborhoods. And so we want to resource people um, through what we call movement prayer, but also to see uh, uh, movement prayer hubs. Um, these are groups that meet over a Zoom, 30 minute Zoom, praying for particular cities, regions and people groups. We'd like to see hundreds of those throughout North America. And so if you want more information about just movement prayer or how you can join one of these hubs or start one um just check that box very important and then finally uh, uh we are right now about to put um the oh excuse me we already put the training link in the chat so i think we're also going to have that form coming in the chat and again you will get that 
uh, via email. So there are four ways to respond on that. All right, yeah. we're going to wrap up here. David, you want to kind of close us out? And yeah, I mean, I, I just want to thank everyone again for being a part of these webinars. We hope to have one another one coming up in the near future, and we'll let you know about that. And you can um, go ahead and, and register for that. But we would, uh, we first of all, we want to say thank you to Roy again. Um, if you haven't read Spent Matches, I would say get a copy of it. I think it, it will be tremendously helpful um, for you as you're beginning to especially plant um, DMM within an existing church. You know, how do you do that? But uh, Roy, um, yeah, would you pray a prayer for all of us that are on this uh, webinar? And, and then we'll close with that. I'd love to. Father, I see so many uh, names of uh, so many friends out there in the uh, attendance list. Uh, I just thank you for a chance to be with them. Uh, so many stories. I love to hear uh, of what you're doing in their lives. I, I pray, Father, that, that um, you would just uh, allow the spirit to be a, the spirit of consolation, the spirit of encouragement to them. Uh, we are pushing up a, a ball up a hill, a, a very big ball up a hill uh, against uh, not just uh, Satan and uh, the powers of darkness in this world, but against tradition. Um, and so we, we ask, Father, that, that you would uh, just encourage us. We, we believe that we uh, are tasting a bit of your heart, uh, that you long. Uh, for your not yet sons and daughters to be a part of your family. And we want to be a part of that because that's what you've called us to. Help us to get ourselves out of the way, Father. Help us to, uh, to not depend on human things uh, like movement tactics and, and, and think that, that this can happen if we just bear down, but help us to, to lean into you to experience your love, to be profoundly impacted by your heart, the heart that you had for us, even when we were running away from you. We were like Abraham. We were an enemy of you, yours, and you made us your friend. And so we thank you for that. And Father, I pray for success. I pray that, that we would see men and women start following you and learn how to move into their social networks and see the gospel move with them and see their friends and their families, their workmates, to see their gym mates, uh, their teammates, uh, to see the, the people that attend classes with them uh, begin to do the same thing. Uh, Father, I pray that you would give us a vision for a new kind of gospel. Many of us have been reared Many of us uh, cut our, our spiritual teeth on a gospel of forgiveness. And, and we need a gospel of kingdom. We need a royal gospel. We need to understand, Father, that, that you came not just to forgive us, but you came to bring heaven to earth. You came to involve us in bringing other men and women into your favor and for them to learn the beauty of what it's like to live in this sin-stained world in the favor of a father who so desperately loves them. So, Father, just to impassion us for our, our space, I pray that everyone listening right now, Father, whether they're live or they're, or they're uh, later on, um, that we would have the courage to create a circle of accountability, that we would pull out a map draw a circle around a particular area and begin to believe that you've called us to make it hard for people in that circle to go to hell, that you desire sons and daughters from that circle, that they're out there, you're working in their lives, and we can join you in the process of finding them and, and seeing them experience your favor. Father, give us the courage to, to, to not only believe it, but to act on it. Um, I thank you for um, these folks, Father. Thank you for the, the life that they've chosen to live. And I, I pray that you just continually encourage them 
Father, they, you know they're doing a good thing. You know they're leaning hard into your kingdom. And so bless their efforts. Make them successful, Father. Give them moments where they can see what they dream of so that they can continue. Father, I thank you for this hour we spent together. Thank you for your, your willingness to, uh, to invest in my life, the men and women who have made uh, incredible sacrifices that allow me to be here and to do what I do. And I'm just grateful for that, Father. And thank you for these men and women too. And I know that they have the same. They have people who have, who've given them a lot. And so we trust, Father, that, that this week, uh, this month and this year, uh, that we'll see tremendous gains for your kingdom in our life. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his life, for his death and resurrection. It's because of him and through him and uh, that we come and we can do all of this. So we ask this in Jesus' name today, Father. Amen.